As a photojournalist during the 60s and 70s, my photographs appeared in major magazines such as Life, Paris Match and Stern. In this video, I'll be telling you all about the cameras I used, show you the photographs I took and explain the technical problems that had to be overcome in order to capture them. In my previous video, we went on the North Sea trawler to look at the arduous and hazardous lives of fishermen during the 60s. Today we'll be going deep under the seas as I described my photographic assignments during the late 60s and early 70s covering British attempts to construct, live and work in houses beneath the waves. During that period, France, Russia, America and Japan were setting aside millions to build underwater habitats in order to conduct research. Much of it, I have to say, military research. In 1969, Brian Ray, a young physicist and scuba diver from Imperial College London, flew out to Malta with a team of diving technologists from both Imperial and Enfield Colleges. Their purpose was to build and live in an underwater house 40, the 40 feet beneath the clear warm waters of the Mediterranean in a place the Maltese had delightfully called Paradise Bay. Brad had developed a device which scrubbed carbon dioxide from the air while replacing it with oxygen. This enabled those living and working in the underwater house to breathe without the need for carrying bottled air. I think the total budget for the, his entire expedition was around one tenth of the development costs of the lavatory in American Sea Lab 3. After being successfully established, his underwater house, which was fitted with electric light and a telephone, was lived and worked in by Brad and some of his team for over a week. Some six fathoms down, they conducted acoustic experiments tested his life support system and made telephone calls to their base in London. The following year I covered the construction of another underwater house, this time not in the warm clear Mediterranean but the cold, dark and murky waters of Plymouth Sound. This time Brown and his team used not rubberized fabric to construct the house but a solid steel cylinder which on both these expeditions I took all my underwater sequences, both in colour and in black and white, using my camera, the Nikodos, which is a Japanese built camera, a very successful little camera. This was first launched in 1963, but the camera itself was based on an earlier design called the Calypso, and this had been invented by the legendary French underwater explorer Jacques. Yves Cousteau. Now let's take a look at this little innovative little underwater camera, the design which enabled it to be used quickly and easily at depths of I believe up to about 60-70 feet. I certainly only took it down to 60 feet. So let me let me show you in detail what, what it consists of. This is on this this is the earliest model. This is a uh, 2.4 lens which is focused with one wheel here, with the aperture being set, it has an F2 aperture being set here. And on this particular model, the shutter speed ranges from a 500 of a second through to bulb, where the shutter will stay open for as long as you want it. And you simply fire the shutter and wide on the film with this action. This has got a viewfinder which makes it very easy to use with a face mask on, which of course you have to wear when you're diving. I later modified this camera working with a design created by a man called Flip Schulke, an underwater photographer himself and also a, a very good engineer. And this contains a 21mm lens, a land lens, but it's fully encapsulated in this perspex of metal, so it's perfectly safe from the water. And it has two gearing systems, one enables you to focus, and the other enables you to set the uh, aperture, which has a maximum aperture 
of f4 and a minimum of f16. In order to use this particular lens, you have to use this viewfinder. This is designed for the 21mm lens. And again, it's got a very clear window through which to look uh, when, when you're wearing a diving mask underwater. Another Nikonis camera I used is this one, which is, a, which is a later model, which is automatic. It's got a built-in light meter, and you can in fact set the shutter so it works fully automatically underwater. This has got a such, such a speed of up to a thousandth of a second, which makes it very, very fast indeed. Really too fast for anything I've ever used underwater. On the hard looking shore of Paradise Bay, the team start to construct their underwater house using Dixian, timber, scaffolding poles and rubberized fabric, which they will inflate to form the balloon type house whilst it is underwater. They follow a plan which has been drawn up months before in London and within a few days the house is built. They must now work on the instruments which are going to go into the house, including the device developed by Brian Ray, which enables them to re-breathe the air. They carry out careful survey works, both on land and diving into the calm waters of Paradise Bay, or using the Dexian-based ladder they've constructed, enter the water in order to carry out a survey of the ocean floor to find which will be working, which will be most appropriate. They test the density of the rock on which they will anchor the house and also conduct survey work using theodolite equipment as on land. Which will enable them to map the ocean meticulously before these scientist divers start construction. The house finished, they carry it carefully with a six-man team of young enthusiasts to the water's edge. Diver enters in order to guide the house into its position some 40 feet beneath the waves. The house is then anchored by steel horses to pins driven into the rocks. It is meticulous and hard work. They then lay a telephone cable out of the house which will also be equipped with its own electric light far from the shore. The house is inflated and the divers check the rubberized fabric to make sure there are no leaks. It can accommodate two team members who will conduct scientific research deep beneath the waves.
When pressure in the balloon house becomes too high, they need to vent the air, which emerges with a rush of bubbles drifting upwards to the surface. Once again, the fabric has to be checked carefully to make sure there are no leaks which could impair the lives of the scientists. The equipment is then carried to the house in watertight boxes. Some of these boxes have to be supplied with air so that they don't get crushed by the pressure of the sea. The house is now ready for occupation and the divers carry the equipment up into the house. A short ladder was attached to the house to enable easy access for the divers. Brad Ray arrives while his colleague speaks on the telephone to the shore. The message is received loud and clear. Brad was also able to speak to London using the same line. Then the storm arrives. The team only just managed to salvage their inflatable craft, which was being bombarded by the heavy seas. It takes team effort to haul the boat from the churning waters onto the safety of the rocky shore. The house itself broke loose from its moorings and was completely wrecked. The team descended in order to rescue the valuable scientific equipment, much of which was also damaged. A sad end to an exhibition which provided one week underwater living for Brown and his team who conducted valuable acoustic experiments with the waves. A year later I was underwater again, this time off Plymouth Breakwater, where we were launching an underwater steel house called Glaucus, which had to be weighed down with large blocks of iron. Visibility was very poor and only enabled me to get close-up pictures of the house with a diver who is fully suited to protect it from the cold, examining the exterior to make sure it is free from leaks. One of the first divers to arrive in the house was Margot Parker, who made everything shipshape the other divers who arrived shortly afterwards and were greeted by her with a warm cup of tea. Later Margot settled down to live for a week with other members of the team in the house and took time to have a cup of tea, some toast and read her magazine while engaged in a little knitting. In my next video we'll be leaving the depth for the height some 12,000 feet of heights to be precise as I exchanged my wetsuit, demand valve and diving cylinders for a safety helmet, goggles and two parachutes while I cover the world famous Falklands sky diving team. A team of expert parachutists who could fall for over a minute through the sky with the skill and courage needed to captivate audiences all over the world. 
If you'd like to see some more of my photographs, please go to www.thewayitwas.uk. If you would like to purchase a copy of my book, The Way It Was, then please go to the same website and take a look at what it contains. If you lived through the 60s, it will bring back some memories. If you never lived through the 60s, you'll find a foreign country where they do things very differently.